Don Favreau was tired of going to movie auditions and facing rejection, so he decided to write his own script, find a director, and have his struggling actor friends fill the roles they inspired. Swingers, the film set in the ultra-hip back alley night spots of Hollywood, is the result, and it is getting a lot of attention and winning praise from reviewers like the New York Times' Janet Maslin, who wrote, the film's inverted sense of high style had such fun with its character's awkwardness that it turned square peg ethos into counter cool. Joining me now is the actor and screenwriter, John Favreau. Welcome. Thanks for having it's me. It's great to have you here. Uh, congratulations. I mean, everybody is talking about this. And especially, not just the critics, but people, in a sense, who love the business and love independent films and love small budget films. And this is small budget. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is, what, a 250000 or something? We, we started off with about that much money. Yeah. Of course, the film you see on the screen is uh, more like a million dollar film once you pay yeah. all the crew and yeah. buy the music and stuff. But it's what people... I mean, yeah. it's what a lot of people say, if, if I had, if, I, if this is what I wish I could do yeah. or had done mm -hmm. from the soundtrack mm -hmm. to, the, to the feel of it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. How did it happen? Well, um, I was an actor. I was in a film, Rudy. I don't know if you remember oh, that film yeah. about Notre Dame. Right. And it was my big break. You know, I was living in Chicago at the time. I had moved there to study improv and got cast from an audition in this role. And it was just, I mean, my family, my friends all felt that now I had arrived. I mean, I was a movie star. Yes. And they I took, saw you on the screen? Sure. I mean, my name was at the beginning of the film. A front credit in a, in a movie is like, uh, you know, a dream come true. And plus, I was very proud of the film. I was very proud of my performance. I had gotten the critics like me, the agents in town, everybody. I was the toast of the town for, you know, that 15 minutes. And I moved out there, and I just didn't work. I just didn't work. I had dropped about 75 pounds. Yeah. The town didn't know what to do with me. And I spent a lot of time with these out-of-work actor friends that also had gotten their big breaks but also weren't working. And so we just kicked around town, and uh, I decided to try my hand at writing. And I just sat down at my computer not thinking anybody would read it. Uh, and certainly I didn't think anybody would make it. And I wrote the script Swingers in about two weeks. You wrote the script in two weeks? Yeah. What happened then? I showed it to my friends. I based the characters sort of on my friends to give them a laugh because I knew they would read it. I showed it to my agent. And she liked the script so much that she went out with it, and people wanted to buy it and develop it. And develop with, with you starring? Or no, with no, no. With me, I, with me, like in a supporting role and as a producer. Right. But basically, it would have been taken away from me. And I sat in my first story meeting. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the film The Big Picture with Kevin Bacon, but there's a there's a wonderful no, there's a yeah. great scene in there where he's sitting down and he's about to make his first movie, and the suggestions that pour his way from these executives are like, this is great, but how about making it in the summertime instead of the wintertime? And what this is, how about putting the whole thing in Vegas? And how about yeah. switching this character to a woman? And by the time I finished, my head was spinning, and I, I decided to set up a reading to show them what the script could sound like with the right people yeah. before they wanted me to make the changes. And I used the cast that you saw in the film. We did a reading, and the reading went so well that my agent said, let's try to make this movie this way instead of trying to change it to fit somebody else's. Yeah. And, and we, we did readings for like two years after that to try to raise money. To raise $250,000? Well, we thought we needed closer to, you know, ten times that to make yeah. it as written. It wasn't until Doug Lyman, the director, came with, uh, he had an investor he had worked yeah. with. This is Arthur Lyman's son, yes. and Arthur Lyman's yeah. a very famous attorney. Here. Yeah, and, uh, and now Doug is a very famous director, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which and is what nice. did he bring to it? He decided to just shoot it in a way that you don't normally shoot a film. Shoot it like a student film. Use a small camera. Don't use a big crew. Don't use a lot of lights. Yeah. Don't do it in the way that you're, you know, almost like Hollywood Shuffle, where they just did it, they did what they had to do to get the film in the can. Yeah. And 250000 was enough to get it in the can. And then what happened? And then we uh, didn't make it into Sundance, <laughs> which was my goal. Not you to, could uh, not get nominated. We couldn't get in because it was, we submitted it on, t on a half-inch tape. We didn't really have the a distributor <laughs> behind us. This is what you play us. in your home VCR. Exactly, yeah. It wasn't good quality. The sound wasn't good. There were no names in it. There was nothing that would hook them in. And they have thousands and thousands of submissions because everybody fantasizes about yeah. being the toast of the town like, uh, you know, like uh, Ed Burns. Yes. And so, and I had actually been there with swingers under my arm the script when Ed Burns had won, and it was so inspiring to me, and we couldn't even get in the door. We just, it wasn't done in time. We did six weeks of post-production on it. It wasn't in the shape you see it now. Now, why doesn't, this shows you how naive I am, why doesn't, with all those people out there, all of them looking for properties, 
all of them. Mm -hmm. you know? Those, not just executives at, at the big companies at Warner Brothers and places like that, but other people who have some, some power. Why wouldn't they recognize this? And why wouldn't they see this? And why couldn't you show it to somebody who would see it right there? Because you had more than just 10 minutes. You had a film. We had a film, yeah. yeah. It's tricky. I don't know, to be honest with you. It, it was too commercial in certain ways. It wasn't commercial enough in other ways. We didn't have big names. Yeah. When they pay you money, they want to know that there's a name that they could put on the video box that will sell it right, if it right. doesn't get a good release theatrically. Right. And there's just too many films out there. You don't know if you're going to hit the big screen. They want somebody to go in there. Yeah. They, they need to cover their bets. They right. need to know that they could sell video units if they can't sell the movie. And we just got... Uh, we've been very lucky. I mean, I think we did a good job on the film. I never thought this would happen. I never thought that this many people would see it. What's happened? It has struck a nerve. We, the timing is just very fortunate for us that this whole Cocktail Nation lounge thing is hitting the general public at the same time that the film's hitting the marketplace. I wrote this thing two, three years ago yeah. when nobody knew about sort of lounge except people in San Francisco and L.A. Now it's spreading east. And we're riding that wave much like how Saturday Night Fever rode the wave of like disco becoming a movement. It was a very small movie, but it just, the timing was just right. And what's the lounge life like? It's a throwback, really. You listen to Sinatra, you sip martinis, you have cigars. The music's kind of low, the women dress in dresses, the guys are in suits. And it's a much more civilized, sort of tongue-in-cheek throwback to the Rat Pack days. And you go swing dancing, you listen to big bands. And it's a really nice alternative uh, to the hip-hop stuff and the, the grunge. It's just people are getting sort of tired of that. Set this up for me. This is where you and friends are discussing etiquette and calling up yeah. women after right. getting their phone numbers. Right. Is that, do I need to know more? Uh, yeah, j except that my character has not dated in, in about six years, and he sort of needs everything spelled and out for him. Part of his story is that he doesn't, he doesn't do well. He doesn't do too well, no. Yeah. As, as, as none of us do after being in a relationship for too long. <laughs> you got to get your sea legs. So <laughs> this is All right, roll tape. Here it is. <laughs> I want to see another scene. This is the vibe. Tell me what this is where you think you're getting the vibe. Oh yeah, this is actually Vince Vaughn is thinks he's he's getting vibe yeah. by uh, by a young lady. All right, yeah. roll tape. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the directing. I mean, you you selected Lyman. You wanted him, and it is said that in order to get the feeling of the the lounges, mm -hmm. you guys went in and said we're doing a documentary. Yeah, uh, we weren't that underhanded about it. The thing was, we used a very small French camera called the Aton 35, about this big, you know? 35 millimeter. 35 millimeter, but it looks like a 16. You have so many people running around Hollywood doing student films and stuff, and short films. We had no crew in a small camera. When we said we were doing a movie and we'd post signs saying we're filming swingers, people assumed because of the size of the crew that we were actually doing like a student film or a documentary. And so it... We were able to go into these locations without hiring extras. We just let the people who were actually there stay there if they didn't mind. We had a lot of friends. But how it. about lighting, which is so crucial? We didn't. It was all about getting it. We, we didn't have enough money to light everything the way you're supposed to because you need a bigger crew and a lot of lights, and it yeah. just takes so much time. Right. So we used a very sensitive film stock, uh, Kodak 5298, which is a new film stock which is very sensitive to light, and we just tried to push it as far as you can. And uh, we weren't like a big feature where we were worried about the look of it, that it looked professional. We took chances. Not everything came out right, but we got enough to put a movie together. We put more of our emphasis on the performances and on getting the story and the script down on film. And we knew that if we got a good story... You'd get it right at its core. You'd forgive everything else. Because if it looks good, you don't have that, Charlie. It doesn't, people don't yeah. care. We had good music and good performances, and the rest of the stuff sort of fell into place around it. Yeah, that's true. But so many television shows try to create a huge, fancy set. Right. And the show was not right at its beginning. Uh, and you look at someone who comes along and creates a successful show like uh, you know, uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the set's just, it's just simple. basic. Well, look at this here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this is less than simple. Uh, Miramax came on. Yes. An easy sale? 
Uh, at the uh, finally it was. Yeah, you to you wanted them for because of their track record with independence. Well, we wanted them because we wanted people to see the movie. Yeah. You know, we, you know, it was a great home movie. It was a very expensive home movie. After our after our first um, screening, then it's something funny. It's like a weird thing in Hollywood. Either nobody wants you, or everybody wants you. Yeah. And once one pe person wanted us, everybody wanted us, and it became a little bit of a tug of war. And Miramax, of course, was a place where we had wanted to be because Tarantino's there, Woody Allen's there, Scorsese's there. Look at the great Sly films. Sly Stallone is there. Sly Stallone's there now. Yeah. But they just have a really, really good reputation among the independent world. And so it was a perfect home for us. And they, I, I think that they're responsible really for, because this script's been around for years, they're responsible for giving it the, the tremendous so sort of buzz. Finally, now that you've made it, now that it's a success, now that you did all that you wanted to do, what's mm -hmm. happening? With me? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's the, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, what do they say? It's like, um, when, you know, when you're smiling, the world smiles with you, you know? And uh, <laughs> so everybody who said that they, who passed on the script initially, so they knew how good it was. They, oh, yeah, they knew. They wanted to do it, but yeah. now they didn't. But they wanted to, but their boss didn't let them, but they're not working there anymore, so now we could work together. I don't know. I'm just happy that I'm getting the opportunity to do what I want. And I, instead of doing everything that everybody wants me to do, which is, of course, all these cocktail nation, buddy, mm -hmm. guy, romantic comedy mm -hmm. things, the next script I wrote is called Leatherheads, which is about the 1926 NFL season. That 26. I 1926. The Duluth Eskimos, the very small road team that saved the whole league back then, with Ernie Nevers and Johnny Blood. Yeah. And I did some research, and my father went to Canton and researched for me. And so I wrote this period you got piece. Got dad involved in this, do you? Yeah, I keep everybody involved. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and um, so I wrote that for Universal, and so hopefully we'll get to see that go into production shortly. And Much then, success. Oh, thanks great a lot. to have you. Great to see this. Thanks happen. for having me, Charlie. Thank you. This is great. John Favreau. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.